today we're going to be talking about identifying and managing diseases in the vegetable garden. And um, I'm, I kind of enjoy this topic um, because it's, it's so challenging. Um, one of the, one of the uh, important things that we do is try to share the best management practices um, of not only disease prevention, but also um, insect management, uh, wildlife management. And we do have upcoming programs on both of these topics coming up soon. Uh, again, welcome to our presentation today, and I hope that you will um, enjoy today's presentation. Do put your questions into the chat box. If we can't answer them in the chat box, then we will be stopping periodically to, to share questions, okay? So again, I'm Kirsten Conrad. I'm the extension agent for Arlington's and Alexandria's Natural Resources Management Program, and our offices are in the Farrington Community Center. And if you're in the area and you'd like to stop by, this is also the location for our help desk. And um, I hope that you will um, take advantage of, this, of the opportunities to uh, achieve, get help from the extension programs in your home counties, as well as from our local office. What's happening at VCE? VCE is Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia is an important partner organization with Extension that helps support the work of Extension Master Gardeners. The email at the help desk that I just mentioned is mgarlalex at gmail.com and is staffed every weekday from 9, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And um, we have um, uh, an, uh, the email services as well as the opportunity to send in photos. Be sure to check out all of our virtual classroom presentations that are at mgnvia.org um, in the on the website, which is an award-winning website, and it's it's um, it's an amazing resource to anyone who wants to explore around in that in that website. Another important um, community asset that we have is the demonstration gardens and the demonstration gardens that are maintained by extension volunteers in our program include the Sunny Garden and Shade Garden that are in Bonner Park, the Glen Collin Library Garden uh, and the Simpson Park Garden, uh, which is one of our gardens in Alexandria. Um, uh, Burlington Center has two little areas you can look at that are maintained by the uh, Master Gardeners and the Organic Vegetable Garden, which is located up at the Potomac Overlook Park, which is a regional park on the northeast side of Arlington is a real treasure. And if you get a chance to go and see that, you should do that. I also want to shout out to a, a garden which is not featured here, and that's the Buddy Ford Nature Center um, demonstration garden at the Buddy Ford Nature Center in Alexandria, which is not pictured here. So there's lots of places for you to go and see some of these, uh, some of our work in action. So today we're talking about plant disease and um, people seem always surprised by the fact that their plants are diseased. Um, and I'll tell you what, our plants are tough, but, they, but the pathogens are tough as well. And so, you know, they travel through the air, they travel from, through, through, the, through water, they, we, we contaminate our gardens by traveling to other locations and bringing it home on our, on our feet. Um, sometimes we, we have external uh, problems that, that stress a plant out and make it susceptible to disease. Uh, but there's lots and lots of reasons why our plants come down with plant problems. The second question people ask, well, okay, but where did it come from? Um, it comes in from insects that are carrying uh, disease pathogens in their gut. Uh, it comes in from uh, infested soil or, or infested plant material that we bring home. Um, Birds and mammals bring in plant disease sometimes. And of course, most importantly, especially with the fungal problems, wind drift and the movement of spores in wind and water is an important way that um, pathogens are passed along to other plants. So we are going to focus on three rules um, for integrated pest management. And one of the things that we would like to do is to pass it on to you, um, some of those things. We're also gonna be talking about fungal diseases, bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens that cause plant disease, physiological problems, we're gonna to touch on some of those because they really are uh, problems that are not disease problems. 
And then, of course, there are problems that are not problems at all. So um, some of the, the issues that we get here at the help desk are easy to solve, and some of them are not. And if you're bringing in a sample to us at Virginia Cooperative Extension to help any office to help identify what's wrong with your plants, you need to bring in a, a good sample. And um, a, a good sample to bring in is not one single leaf, um, especially for ornamental plants. We want to see the transition of disease from uh, healthy tissue to disease tissue. So a, a branch or something like that would be very appropriate. Photographs are always very appropriate. And uh, if you want to bring in an entire plant, that will be even better. Okay, so um, help, help us help you by bringing us a good sample to start with. If you have questions about what's a good sample, you can call your local extension office and the help desk to uh, ask that question. So integrated pest management uh, is a way of controlling <clears throat> plant pests, diseases, insects, and so on with the most environmentally friendly means of, of management as well as the most effective means of, of management. The environmental stresses that our plants are under are real and numerous. Um, we have conditions that are too hot, too cold. Uh, we have too wet, too dry. Um, we have the urban heat island effect here in Arlington. We also have pollution from cars and other sources that help stress out our plants. Stress is an important consideration because if our plants are stressed, they become more susceptible to both disease and insect infestation. So the toolbox that you have um, includes techniques to maximize your plant health. Make sure that you have the right plant in the right place that you're choosing a plant that is going to enjoy the conditions that you have. A plant that needs full sun is going to need a minimum of six to eight hours of direct light per day. A plant that needs shade is going to be stressed out in the sun. So don't, don't make sure that you understand the, the cultural conditions under which your plant wants to grow. And one of the links that we're going to share with you is the Extension Master Gardener Best Management Practices that uh, um, has been compiled over for a number of different subject matter areas. The vegetable gardening section is in there, but there's also other sections about wildlife management, as well as um, you know, stormwater management and so on. So your number one rule is reduce environmental stresses. Number two is break that host pest environment triangle. Okay, this is an important idea for everybody to understand about plant disease. Plant disease occurs when you have a favorable environment for a pathogen to take hold of a plant. And of course, a host plant, which is susceptible to that pathogen, okay? If you can break that triangle at any point, you can stop a plant disease in its tracks. For example, powdery mildew is enhanced by um, having uh, conditions that are crowded for your plants, overhead watering, and of course, a host that is um, susceptible to powdery mildew. And by reading up about your plants, you should be able to understand which of the uh, which of the diseases that your plant is susceptible to. And one of the best tools we have for that is the pest management guide. And this is produced in a new version every single year um, by, by Virginia Tech. And the pest management guide will not only identify help you manage your disease problems, it will tell you which plants are susceptible to which pathogens. And so this is an important concept. If you can't, we can't really do much about the pathogen. If you have a susceptible plant that is going to become ill, the pathogen spores, the plant spores are everywhere. They're in the air, they're around us all the time. And so it's very difficult to limit the pathogen in the air if you have a susceptible host. So if this is an important idea to you, maybe you will know how to um, choose a host plant which is, which is not susceptible, resistant to a particular disease, or maybe you can change the environment to make it more sunny, more shady, whatever it's going to take to change the um, susceptibility of that host plant to that pathogen. 
The third rule is to take a pragmatic approach. This picture is of microsphera disease on strawberry. Microsphera is, is a common, maybe even the most common um, strawberry plant disease. And one of the ideas here is that it rarely kills the plant. This disease is common. It doesn't it rarely kill the plant. So how much damage can you live with? Um, if your plants get spotted like that, you not necessarily want to do not necessarily want to pull the plant out and remove it. But it's a very common fungal problem. If your leaf is more than thirty percent compromised, if it's more than thirty percent eaten up by plant disease, you're going to want to remove that leaf. Um, in our books, that leaf, that leaf is no longer providing the services to the plant that it needs to do, and so you should remove it. Should you throw out the entire plant? If it's showing more than 30 to 40% damage, you may wish to cut it back, okay? But you need to decide how much damage you could tolerate. And that's an important idea for many people to understand that not every disease needs to be treated the first time you see it. Okay, we're gonna launch now, right? First of all, into fungal diseases. And this fungal disease uh, fungal diseases are probably the most common uh, problem that we have that affects plant vascular tissues. This particular problem is fusarium. And fusarium, again, is a disease that, that is in the soil. It infects plants through the roots. A susceptible plant turns yellow, uh, beginning from the base of the plant. There's a picture of a, of a, of a tomato plant, of course. And the, the picture below shows the brown uh, vascular tissue, which is caused by this, this particular disease. When it turns brown like that, that, that means that the vascular tissue is compromised and it cannot take up water or transmit nutrients through the plant. But the leaves and stems turn yellow beginning from the base of the plant. The plants will wilt um, and become stunted because they're not getting the nutrients they need. Yields are obviously going to be reduced, and of course, the plant may die if it becomes bad enough. This fungus does prefer warm, dry weather with soil temperatures between 60 degrees and 90 degrees. And susceptible plants include cabbage, celery, melons, and peas, potatoes, spinach, and tomatoes. Turnips and watermelons can also be affected. The spores of this particular uh, fungal organism can live in the soil for up to 20 years. And so if you develop a fusarium related problem, the biggest thing you can do is to not plant fusarium um, um, susceptible plants in that soil for a long time. Prevention is going to include uh, resistant varieties, the rotation of crops so that you can, uh, can um, essentially starve out the fusarium organism in the soil, and of course, the removal and destruction of infected plants. There are no fungicides that are effective against fusarium. Verticillium is a very similar, a soil-borne fungal problem. It infects the leaves through the plant roots, just as fusarium does, and the damage is very similar as well. The leaves and stems turn yellow, the plants wilt, and the stems turn brown along the vascular tissue, plant growth is stunted and the yields are reduced. Now verticillium also is, affects ornamental plants as well. And one of the diagnostic tools is to, um, to take a stem and to um, slice it down the length of it. And if you can see that brown um, vascular tissue that is diagnostic for this particular um, soil-borne fungal problems. The verticillium does live in soil and over winters in plant debris. So if you have this in your vegetable garden, sanitation is going to be very important to uh, prevent further problems. Okay, prevention, uh, let's see, you can use a um, four-year rotation for, for non-resistant varieties. And of course the sulfur fungicide can help to um, slow down the disease problem. Now it's important something to think about here. I noticed that I said seven to 10 days that the, the, the sulfur fungus have to be reapplied every seven to, seven to 10 days. Fungal problems cannot be cured. 
as we understand that word. Um, curing um, require, you know, means that we reverse the effects of the disease. There's no reversal of these effects. You can only prevent fungal disease from getting established. And so the, it's very important to think about how we use plants and how, what plants we select to put in our garden. And our willingness to apply a fungicide every seven to 10 days, if that's the case. Corn smut is a fungal disease and it, ca it causes um, galls on the um, corn seedlings, stalks, and the ears of the, of the corn. Now, this is an ugly looking whitish gray gall and that eventually will turn black and it will burst, releasing thousands of spores. Now, I include this in here, even though it's um, corn is not a, a vegetable crop that is grown very often in our urban area. It's a very popular crop uh, to grow in, in places where people have room. And um, this, is, this is an important cultural consideration for the production of an edible um, ear of corn. Corn is wind pollinated in order for the pollen that is at, produced at the top of the plant to be able to reach the silk, which will help to um, produce the ear of corn, fill out ear of corn, you have to have a block of corn to, in order to encourage that kind of wind pollination and transfer of, of um, pollen. The disease can be spread also in the wind, okay? It can also be spread uh, by humans touching plants from one to another. And of course, the resistant, the use of resistant varieties is going to be what the number one um, way to avoid having this problem. Now, some people want this problem and corn smut is edible. You can even buy it canned. So it has ceremonial, uh, culinary and medicinal uses in Central and South America. And even in ancient peoples of the, what is now the United States, um, this corn smut um, was harvested and used as an as important part of a diet. Uh, it is a fungus and it does add that mushroom flavored quality to addition which it's used. I love the names of these diseases, huh? Um, black leg is a fungus disease that, that results in something called dry rot. Um, black leg occurs on potatoes and it's carried on the seed and lives in the soil. Humid and rainy weather favor the development of black leg disease. Uh, and what first manifests as gray spots um, with, with specks of black dots appearing in those gray spots on the leaves and stems. The leaf edges will wilt and turn bluish or red colored and the plant eventually wilts and dies. Spread is from infected seed, and one way to control uh, the spread of, of many disease problems on seed is to do a water bath treatment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This is a common disease on potatoes in um, Central, Southern, and Eastern North America, and the prevention and controls for this are going to be um, copper fungicides. Again, right plant, right place, right treatment for a disease problem is gonna be important. And you can um, purchase varieties of potatoes which are resistant to um, black leg. Neck rats um, are also a, a fungal problem on onions. It affects chives, garlic, margarine, oregano. Some of the, um, uh, many of our herbs are, are susceptible to something called neck rat. It attacks onions in storage as well and it overwinters in infected bulbs. So if you, are, if you do not harvest all of your bulbs from the garden that are, uh, are perhaps damaged by this particular fungal problem, you will have it live on in your soil and will um, infest future crops. The fungus overwinters like that in plant debris. And so, and just like black leg, plant debris cleanup and sanitation are very important to, um, to, as a, a control mechanism. Keep the soil healthy, keep it rich. What does that mean? Make sure that it has lots of organic matter that is constantly being replenished for the um, nutrient uh, needs of the microorganisms in the soil. 
Make sure that you remove all plant debris from the base of the soil and allow plants to mature completely before harvesting. Make sure that onions are cured before they are stored and by the instructions for curing bulbs as you harvest them. Okay, let's go on. Uh, here's root rots. I once um, had a conversation with an agent south of here uh, when, I was, when I was new here. And I said, ask him, what was the number one plant disease problem that he saw in his work? Oh, he said, root rots, it's all root rot. Well, it's not all root rot, but this is very ubiquitous. This is a fungal disease that's caused by a number of different kinds of pathogens that are listed there. Uh, Bicopter is probably, some, probably something that most of us have heard, but there are other organs, organisms also that cause root rot. It lives in the soil and it affects the plant vascular system in such a way that um, the roots are stunted, the top of the plant becomes stunted, and um, in some cases dies completely because of, its, uh, of the fungal infestation in the plant. Acceptable plants are, are, include beans, carrots, corn, and sometimes peas, okay? You need to remove and destroy infected plants that show any signs of root rot. And one of those signs is if you dig them up, the plant on the left in the picture is totally healthy. It has those white creamy colored roots. The pictures become progressively, the roots become progressively darker as you move to the right. And infested roots will have a dark um, outer layer of, of cells on the, on the, that have died that are on the roots. And you can actually take the, your fingers on one of those roots and pull lightly, grip lightly and pull it. And that black outer layer of um, cells will slip right off of the root. It's, a, it's not always easy to, to tell, but again, this disease is gonna be favored by really totally wet soils. Um, and um, one of the control mechanisms is to water less frequently but for longer periods so that the soil becomes uh, moist all the way down into the root zone, but then is allowed to dry out. Got to remove and destroy infected plants because the disease will proliferate um, in the roots and the plants and will travel and infect nearby plants as well. Make sure your soil is well drained. Rotate your crops so that you don't have to worry about this on future, future years. If your soil is too wet, you need to raise your beds and make sure that you uh, can do anything you can do to improve the drainage in the soils. Club root is a fungal disease which lives in the soil as well. It enters the plant through its roots and causes deformation and um, um, reduced vascular capacity of, of plants that are in the cucurbit family. And the cucurbits include broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, Chinese cabbage, collards, kohlrabi, turnips, and so on. The fungus spores do spread from infected plants by wind, by water, and sometimes by tools. So if we're digging around a plant that has club root, we need to be careful to clean our tools before we move to another area. The spores can survive for at least seven years. So crop rotation in a situation where club root exists is going to be um, one of the things that you can do to reduce the, inc the incidence of this disease. You need to remove disease plants from the garden. A four year rotation is probably enough um, to do with, these, with this particular problem. And of course, because club root thrives in acidic soil, you need to add lime to raise the pH, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, um, if the pH is below 6.0. 7.2 or anything above seven is going to be um, a really great way to control this particular problem. Asparagus rust and bean rust are um, probably the, the, the type of damage that is done by these particular diseases is probably familiar to anybody who has a hibiscus plant or out in the garden, uh, okra. Rust is a fungal disease which shows up as tiny rust colored spores that mass on the stems and even sometimes fruit and leaves of susceptible plants. The um, black 
spores are visible late in the summer. And the, uh, but the rust colored um, growth on the plant tissues will show up sooner. Rust spores are blown by the wind or carried by gardeners, tools, animals, or insects, and they overwinter too in plant debris. So the cleanup of, of an area which is infested with this particular disease is going to be very important. Resistant varieties exist and they should be used whenever possible. One of the reasons that I promote the use of hybrid or perhaps I should say non heirloom plants is that beginner gardeners are challenged to prevent disease problems to begin with. And using seed that is resistant or a variety which is resistant to disease that is common in that particular crop is something that uh, we as, as um, you know, educators promote. So we have to um, avoid as much as possible the proliferation of chemical controls. Um, sulfur spray, sulfur is a, is a naturally occurring element which can be applied every seven to 10 days to, to help control rust infestation. Another big control for fungal disease problems is as much as possible, keep water off of the leaves. Try to avoid overhead watering. And uh, I know that's, that's a laughable concept when we live in an area where it rains frequently, but um, make sure that your plants are spaced out so that they can dry, so the leaves can dry. And especially do not do overhead watering in the evening, Temp cool temperatures with warm days, cool evening temperatures, wet leaves and warm days are a recipe for fungal disease problems. Anthracnose is very, very common on lots of different kinds of plants. Um, on the upper left, you have um, anthracnose on pumpkin and you can see the um, depressed um, uh, spore centered dark spore um, growths in, the, in those depressions. The bottom left is anthracnose on beans. And of course the top right is a tomato that has anthracnose problems. Uh, make sure that you are doing the plant uh, cleanup uh, because if you can stop this disease from, from expressing those spores into the garden environment, you can cut down on this. The anthracnose organisms, which, it, which um, um, attack different kinds of plants are typically unique, but they are all related in the same family. But there's many, many hosts. In addition to these three, we've got blackberries, cantaloupe, uh, certainly cucumbers and melons get anthracnose. Uh, mint can show signs of anthracnose, as well as rhubarb, squash, tomatoes, watermelons, and so on. Anthracnose overwinters in the garden in debris of diseased plants. So sanitation, again, is gonna be very important. Disease is favored by high humidity, high rainfall and high temperatures. So those are the kinds of conditions that we typically have here in the North American, Eastern North America summer. And so the use of resistant varieties is going to be very important. You can spray or dust with a fixed copper or sulfur-based fungicide every seven to 10 days. Um, that takes real dedication. So remove and discard infected plants is going to be an important part of control. And of course, um, you don't want to save seed from an area which has been infested with anthracnose. Rotate your crops, uh, avoid working the garden when it's over wet, which can result in the spread of, sp spread of spores. In other words, before you go down to pull the weeds and make your way through the bean patch um, with your, to, to pull weeds or to pick beans, make sure that the leaves have dried and keep your tools clean. Okay, now we're gonna talk about mildew. Downy mildew is a fungal disease uh, that thrives where nights are wet and cool and days are warm and humid. Um, again, warm days, cool nights and leaf wetness are going to be the kinds of recipe which favors disease development, especially fungal disease. Downy mildew um, has yellowish to light green areas on the surface of the older leaves and a whitish growth that will develop on the bottom of the leaves. Now this picture shows the bottom of the leaf on top of the, um, the top of another leaf, okay? 
And you can see that the top of the leaf, which is at the bottom, um, shows the yellowish um, growth, the yellow spot. And this is an extreme close-up. And the bottom of the leaf shows this almost felt-like um, surface, which is um, coating the bottom of the leaf. Susceptible plants include beans, cauliflower, chard, cantaloupes. It's a long, long list that includes onions, it includes um, almost all members of the cucurbit family, the squash, tarragon can be affected, um, and watermelons, and so on. Spores can be carried of this fungal disease, can be carried by insects, wind, rain, uh, even it can even be spread through infected seeds. So water bath of infected seeds is very important here too. Plant resistant varieties. Downy mildew is a um, um, caused by a, a, um, an oomycete, which is slightly different from a fungal organism, but for our purposes, it's, it's virtually the same. Symptoms of downy mildew also can look purpley um, on the leaf underside. Downy mildew is a little different from powdery mildew. Powdery mildew can look like somebody has gone through your vegetable patch with a bottle of talcum powder. Low soil moisture and high humidity can, um, can favor this particular disease development, but this is going to look like a, a gray, white, or even brown velvety mold that appears on the bottom of the leaves. Susceptible plants, uh, it's again, it's a long, long list of susceptible plants, include apples, cherries, cucumbers, um, all the you know, plums, pumpkins, raspberries, all the members of the cucurbit family are susceptible to powdery mildew, unless you can find one, a cultivar, which is um, developed for resistance. The over, the, this pathogen overwinters in plant debris, it is also in apple and plum buds, where it kind of just settles down and just waits for favorable conditions to emerge. Spores can be spread by water, by wind, and of course we can spread it ourselves by walking through a patch when the spore sporulation is happening. Resistant varieties is going to be your number one um, mode of control against powdery mildew. In the next picture, we're gonna show you what powdery mildew looks like compared to um, downy mildew. And of course, downy mildew up here on the left um, has um, a yellow spot that is going to be on the top of the leaf. Powdery mildew has a whitish or grayish uh, powdery looking spot that's on the top of the leaf. On the bottom of the leaf, you're going to have, with downy mildew, you're going to have that development of that furry, felt like uh, fungal growth on the bottom. The powdery mildew is going to have it on the top. And that's kind of, it's hard to see that sometimes because over here on the right side of the top, you have powdery mildew appearing on a, I believe a pumpkin leaf. And you can see that it, it looks like a white spot, but if you look very closely, it, look, it appears to have a, a powdery quality to it that you can actually rub with your finger. Downy mildew on the lower left is uh, pictured here on, on um, basil, uh, and the basil leaf and uh, the spinach is also susceptible to it, but it's often confused with botrytis, which is another uh, leaf rot problem. But again, the downy mildew is on the, the, the main growth is going to be on the bottom of the leaf. The reason it's important to understand exactly what the identification is of your plant disease problem is because the controls are going to be different. If you are searching for a control for downy mildew, that's going to be a very different type of um, product that you're going to buy than what it is for powdery mildew. Okay, we're gonna stop here for questions, um, but we have coming up, we're gonna talk about bacteria pathogens, viral pathogens, physiological problems, and problems that are really not problems. Now, this is a picture here of a tomato stem, a very close up with, these little um, growths coming out of it. And it's kind of freaky looking when you see that for the first time. And sometimes they can actually get quite long on the stem. But this is an example of adventitious roots or totipotency, um, which allows us to 
be able to, the tomato exhibits an abundance. And this particular uh, can be a sign of a disease problem, but typically it's simply a physiological response to the normal plant growth. And it allows us to plant a stem, any part of the stem deeper in the ground to produce a stronger plant. So this is adventitious roots. Okay, any questions, Betsy or Jason? We do have a few questions. Um, one attendee from Arlington said that the lower leaves of her tomato plants are yellowing and browning and dying off. She felt like this, it was a little early in the season for this to be um, happening and wants to know what the cause could be. Okay, well hold that thought because we're gonna talk about tomatoes in just a moment. Um, and it's, it, it could be a, um, um, an early blight or a late blight. Um, and um, we, will, we, will, we will come back to that, okay? Okay, and another person had a question unrelated to vegetables. It was about her peach tree with sap coming out. I would suggest that that's a good um, reason to contact our help desk. Um, if you do it by email, you can do it with pictures and Jason put that address in the chat box. Okay, thank you. And then there was affirmation. It was good that you talked about um, downy and powdery mildew because there were a couple of people who affirmed that um, that's an ongoing problem. And one of the people who did also referred to the problem of rabbits in the garden, which I believe you will cover in a separate presentation since we're talking about diseases here. Uh, yes, we're gonna be talking about animal pests in the garden in August. Um, maybe too late to help you then, but if you have questions about rabbits and control, we can, you know, please do contact us at the um, help desk. Another person wanted to know, do their gardening gloves need to be washed and or sterilized to prevent the spread of disease? And if so, with what? Um, you can use um, a, 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 a chlorine-based product to sterilize tool, the 10% solution should do it. Um, keep in mind the chlorine is highly corrosive and that um, you can, you need to clean and wipe off your tools when after you finish sterilizing um, with a clean rag and dry them and possibly even apply a little bit of mineral oil to them. Okay. Someone else said, how do you use baking soda? Uh, just sprinkle it on, will it get rid of the mildew? Um, baking soda or, or um, um, those products are considered to be, are listed as a, an organic control for some um, bicarbonate soda for some organic, for, I'm sorry, um, for some fungal diseases. And you can use it in a solution, um, you know, mix it up in water. It doesn't mix very well, um, but adding a little bit of, of uh, um, um, a little tiny bit of detergent to the water when, you, when you're mixing this will help provide a, um, um, a, 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 a way to apply the product evenly and mix it up evenly. And then there was a follow-up question about other home remedies, vinegar, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide um, is listed and we're gonna talk about organic remedies at the end of the presentation. Right. Okay, and that's it. Okay, all right. Um, okay, move on here. We're going to talk about um, this. Uh, the next section talks about bacterial diseases. Um, this is black rot. Uh, it's encouraged by wet weather. Certainly, it affects um, almost all of the members of the cucurbit or, or, or crucifer family plants, which include broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, and so on, turnips, kohlrabi. Um, and uh, it is encouraged by wet weather. It infests young as well as mature plants and seedlings turn yellow and die, but the older plants develop wedge-shaped yellow regions and margins which expand to the center of the leaf. The leaves will brown, die, and sometimes drop off the plant. And if you look at the stem and cross section, you will see that the vascular tubes in these stems turn black and foul smelling. The heads of the plants may rot because they're not um, obviously not getting getting the nutrients and water they need, um, and the spread um, can be um, 
can be the can be um, sorry can be encouraged um, by um, by movement in of soil and plant debris. Prevention and controls include um, well, it doesn't include much practical. You can remove and then destroy infected plants. You can clean the garden in the fall, and that should be done every year to manage control, uh, to manage many of these diseases. And micronized sulfur um, can be applied um, to nearby but uninfected plants every seven days to prevent the infestation from getting a hold on healthy plants. But again, are you, it needs to be applied every week until harvest. Um, I'm a lazy gardener. I would much better prefer to, to try to find plants that are not susceptible to this problem. Bacterial blight um, is a kind of a general name of a bacterial disease that affects um, different kinds of plants, beans and peas, for example. And it occurs in where we have a high prolonged humidity. And anything you can do to reduce the humidity in your garden will help prevent plant disease. You can um, not, not crowd the plants, make sure that they are not all growing together in a big mass, um, make sure and they're spaced appropriately. Um, make sure that you've removed anything that impedes the movement of air through your garden um, and try to avoid overhead water and it's going to leave the plants wet. Bacteria enters the plants through small openings and wounds and uh, it can be spread by wind and as well as infected seeds. Sanitation is going to be very important. Uh, the cleanup of the garden is, you know, I sound like a broken record here, but um, sanitation is next to cleanliness. You know, you need to uh, rotate crops, you need to avoid work in the garden when it's wet, and you need to do sanitation at the end of the year. This is uh, one mode of control um, that you can use to prevent some bacterial disease problems. And I know I talked about it as a prevention for fungal disease problems as well. This is definitely something that works um, for uh, bacterial infested seed. Now, we don't know if they're infested or not. So one good control mechanism is to water back treat seeds that you're saving um, and seeds that you've gotten from a source that may not be quite as well managed. So the water back temperatures and the length of time that a seed is treated vary from, from seed to seed. It works best on small seeds, not large seeds. And this particular site has a very good um, um, recipe. It has, a, has this table, which extends um, for, for many more lines to talk about specific seeds and how long they should be treated and at what temperature the, um, they should be treated at. So this is a very good way to control bacterial blights on, on crucifers, cucumbers, beans, and so on. Okay, let's talk about bacterial world on cucumbers. And this is a heartbreaking disease that most of us are, who have ever grown cucumbers, uh, except for Jason, who told me he's never had this problem, um, have. I certainly have always had this whenever I've grown cucumbers. At least one plant does this sort of collapse in the middle of growing season. This is a very common problem in moist soils and at temperatures over 75 degrees, Fahrenheit, air temperatures at over 75 degrees, it is a, um, a, um, a common, common problem. What happens here is that the disease um, enters, the, enters the plant um, through wounds and feeding of insects and so on. It also under those plants, you know, and wounds that are created from, from wind movement and people moving through the garden. And it is spread by an insect, the cucumber beetle, um, that, um, uh, you know, does it feeds on the plant and then leaves its species on the plant. You'll come out one day and, and all of a sudden the plant will be collapsed and eventually it turns brown and, and the whole vine dies. It is common in moist soils and the um, temperature is typically over 75 degrees when this is active. Now prevention and controls include um, removing and destroying infected plants and uh, making sure that you um, 
have cleaned up anything that um, that shows signs of this before it spreads. Okay. One certain way you can do is control the beetles. And we have striped as well as spotted cucumber beetles here, and they're kind of cute, but they do a whole lot of damage to your cucumbers. Rotenone or Sabadilla are two um, organic controls that you can use to manage the insect. And of course, the bleach solution that I mentioned earlier will be helpful for sanitizing tools and hands before you move on to from one plant to another. Um, some other tips and tricks for this one. Um, sanitation, of course, remove infested plants. Avoid planting cucurbits next to corn. There seems to be a connection between, um, between the uh, occurrence of, of bacterial wilt on cucumbers and um, um, you know, um, proximity to corn plantings. There are two varieties, um, Saladin and County Fair 83 tomato cucumbers, which are resistant to this uh, particular problem. And um, they are, um, you know, you can certainly be part of it, be rid of it if you do crop rotation. Now, the bacterial wilt is um, one of the, the diagnostic symptoms is to, to cut a stem and to either pull it slowly apart or to touch a knife to one cut end and slowly draw the knife blade away from the cut edge. You should be able to see the white uh, bacterial exudate come, coming from the stem. It shows up as a whitish, whitish colored, um, kind of almost a sticky sort of looking sap. And it is diagnostic for bacterial wilt pathogen. You can also put the cut stem into a glass of water and you can see in severe cases where the bacterial um, uh, bacterial pathogens are, are, are spreading out into the water in white streams of, of liquid. So um, it's kind of interesting, <laughs> but um, sad for our cucumber crops. Okay. Curly top uh, and mosaic are two viral diseases. And the curly top is, a, is a, in this situation, the leaves will pucker, they will curl and twist inwards. Um, typically the, the curling is inwards with the leaf edges and then back on itself. And the, they will eventually turn a little bit yellow and the plants become stunted. Yield obviously is going to be reduced and susceptible plants include beans, muskmelons, pumpkins, tomatoes, watermelons, and so on. This is a um, curly top is spread by white flies and leaf hoppers. And so prevention um, can consist of control, covering plants with row covers to prevent access to the plants by leaf hoppers. Leaf hopper control can be attempted and um, uh, because when you use a row cover, you have to, to also remove it so that pollination of the flowers can occur. Curly top is not something you can cure, and so resistant varieties are going to be your number one best way to prevent this. Mosaic is also another viral disease. It's very common. Um, the susceptible plants include beans, cucumbers, lettuce, melon, peppers, potatoes, Sometimes raspberries even, um, squash, tomatoes, and watermelon also can be affected by mosaic virus. Again, it is a virus. It cannot be cured. It is a systemic problem kind of inside the plant. And so anything that shows signs of this uh, viral um, symptom, you need to remove that plant from the garden so that the insects are not going to spread it. Aphids and cucumber beetles can also um, spread this, 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 this plant disease. Insect control, we're gonna be talking about in two weeks, you can do it with insecticidal soap or light horticulture oil spray. And again, you don't want to work with the plants when they are wet. So always make sure that the plant is, the, the garden is somewhat dry before you enter it. And um, that you have um, um, provided the spacing that is needed to, to optimize your plant growth. Aster yellows um, is a chronic systemic disease. Uh, which again, it's, it's a, um, caused by a, a, a viral problem. It's, a, it's actually a mycoplasmus bacteria, but it's often considered um, um, a, a viral virus problem. 
because it is a, um, the, the, the symptoms are very similar. Um, the mycoplasma bacterial organism causes the plants to be stunted. Um, the crop, the root is, is stunted, it, it's misshapen, it's um, deformed, it produces lots of hair and in carrots, it produces lots of extraneous um, hair growth on the, um, on the root. And the top of the plant can turn uh, a reddish or bronze colored foliage. The aster yellow organism, the uh, mycoplasmas, it also affects ornamental plants. Uh, coneflower, for example, is commonly afflicted by this disease, uh, coriopsis, and potatoes are also susceptible. It occurs throughout North America, and um, its um, prevention and control is going to consist of removing and destroying infected plants. Make sure you buy plants and seed which are um, vetted by a um, um, responsible grower um, that, are, that are treated and that comes from healthy crops. Okay. Sometimes your leaf hoppers can be controlled with diatomaceous earth, insecticidal soap, uh, pyrethrum, or other horticulture spray oil to help reduce the incidence of the insects that spread the disease. Okay. This is back to the fungal disease now, but I wanted to put it here so we could compare these three together. On the left, we have early blight. In the middle, we have late blight. And on the right, we have leaf spot or septoria on tomato. And these are the three most common tomato fungal problems that we have. Early blight is going to um, um, overwinter and plant debris. Sanitation is key when the plants are finished growing, rip them out and clean up the garden. It's going to start with an irregular dark spot uh, that appears on older leaves. Um, those concentric dark rings that you can see not very well, um, but, you, but the, if you look at the black spot, you can see concentric rings that develop um, as, the, as the disease spreads through the leaf. You can also see the uh, problem happening on older leaves first, uh, and defoliation, of course, can also occur. Susceptible plants besides tomatoes include celery and potatoes, and the um, control for this is going to consist of making sure that you plant healthy tomato seedlings to start with, and rotate your crops. Keep your, keep your, um, your plants separated so that they have air circulation, and keep the garden free of plant debris. You can mulch the garden to prevent the splash of fungal organism up into the plant, um, but you don't want to have plant debris grown laying on the ground. Um, Copper-based fungicide can be used every seven to 10 days, and the you can buy a variety of tomato which is um, resistant to early blight. Late blight is also a fungus that attacks plants after they bloom. They're gonna have a water-soaked looking round spot or a patch um, that, that um, forms on the leaves. Um, the spots will turn kind of a uh, brownish black color with a white fungal growth that forms on the underside of the leaf. Fungus overwinters in plant debris, again, sanitation, um, cleaning your seed, um, water and wind can also carry the disease. Uh, Rainy, foggy weather with high, very high humidity with extended temperatures between 70 degrees and 80 degrees during the day and 20 degrees cooler at night are gonna be favorable to late blight, okay? So this often occurs, uh, starts to occur in the middle of summer and uh, it's caused by an organism called Phytophthora. Resistant varieties exist and um, try to avoid the, the, the use of plants that are not resistant in areas where you know that late blight, late blight has occurred in the past. Copper-based fungicide can be helpful, but again, it's something you're gonna to have to apply every seven to 10 days. Septoria leaf spot, which is pictured on the right side, is going to start out with lots of little tiny spots on the leaves. Um, sometimes they're gray, sometimes they're tan to light brown. Um, they often have purplish colored borders, if you look at it with a, with a hand lens. 
as these spots become bigger, you will begin to see black dots in the center, spore producing structures that will appear in the center of the dots. And uh, the leaves can also drop as a result of becoming terribly infested. The spread of this is going to be by seeds, uh, rain and wind. Uh, make sure that you are not working with wet plants and try to provide enough air circulation and pruning to reduce the amount of foliage which is on the plant that will prevent air circulation. Copper dust or liquid copper spray every seven to 10 days will help too. Okay, circle spore. Um, which is pictured on the left side is a very common disease of peppers. It's a fungal leaf spot. And um, the, the centers of the, um, uh, of the spots are going to be light gray or so with black spore structures in the center of them. And on this picture, you can see the concentric rings of the growth of the organism through the, the enlargement of the spot. Um, typically, there's a little halo around the plant, as you see in the bottom left, um, and um, the picture shows the, what the spots look like on the older leaves of the pepper. This is a, um, a, 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 a problem that can be reduced by the, by the application of mulch below the plants, but not too much because you still need um, good air circulation in the soil. On the right side, we have a bacterial leaf spot of pepper. And these are going to be really, really small uh, brown circular spots. Typically, they do not have a yellow halo around them. And the centers sometimes do not fall out, but as the one circle spore sometimes does, you have a, a, an empty spot there. The spots on the fruit are going to be about a quarter inch in size, um, slightly raised, and kind of a scabby sort of um, aspect to them. They often occur on the stem end of the fruit. Uh, but it does not usually rot out the fruit. And is it safe to eat? Well, you're gonna, if you're going to peel it and remove that, yes, probably. Uh, you can use copper to try to um, um, uh, manage the disease problem and prevent it from spreading. Treat healthy plants. Uh, crop rotation is going to be key where this has occurred in the past. Don't plant peppers there again. And in fact, I was going to mention also that I forgot to do with Phytophthora. Um, uh, can occur and it is a problem with this pepper plant. Um, and we have discovered by, by that crop rotation uh, is important, but in gardens where peppers are planted after beans, um, the Phytophthora um, seems to be more um, prevalent and root rot can occur. Sanitation is going to help with this um, and um, you can also get anthracnose and peppers too, another fungal problem. So a question that came up related to the end of um, the last part of the discussion, when you have a basil plant that has downy mildew, can you eat the good part of the plant? Does the downy mildew make you sick because it's there on the plant or what's the story with that? Um, it will not make you sick, um, but I think that, um, you know, an effort should be made to, to um, eat the healthy parts of the plant as opposed to the plants to the, to the plants that are infected. Sure, okay. And then a question about container gardening. If you have a diseased plant, do you have to replace all the soil in the container or just remove part of it and kind of work your way around it? Well, it depends what the disease is, is that right? And I think that it's important. You can do crop rotation in containers simply by switching out your crop the following year. And containers are also uh, a recommended way of providing crop rotation to in-ground gardens. You can rotate your crops through a uh, container-grown planting to be able to avoid um, planting it in the same place in an in-ground section every year. But the answer to your question is that, um, you know, if you plant a susceptible plant in a container, in which a, a soil-borne disease has occurred, you are most likely going to get that problem again. And so um, while I don't, I don't think that it's necessary all the time to replace all the soil, um, it's just a good idea to understand what's going on so that you don't repeat the mistake. I mean, what about non-diseased crops? <clears throat> Can you reuse soil 
that they've been grown in and do you have to treat it in any way, um, clean it or just add compost to it? In a container, right? Yes. Um, well, again, um, the crop rotation, even in containers can be valuable, a valuable way of reducing the incidence of plant disease. Um, and we'll talk about crop rotations coming up here a little bit. Um, but um, essentially, you want to rotate families of plants. And the families of plants are going to be able to withstand um, um, different kinds of pressures. OK, let me correct myself. Um, that question about reusing um, uncontaminated soil, the person wanted to clarify that the question is about ground soil for beds, not containers. OK, um, unless I mean, you what if, what if some of us have very small gardens? I mean, my garden is, you know, six by 15. Um, can I keep reusing all that soil year after year? Of course you can. Of course you can. Um, but I, I, I started to say, I misunderstood the question, that the garden soil is, should never, should rarely be used in a container because the soil structure is, is, um, becomes destroyed when you move the soil and the, the drainage um, in a smaller container as opposed to the larger area out um, in, in the ground is going to be compromised by putting using garden soil in the container. And so garden soil, um, even healthy garden soil is not typically a good thing to use in a, in a container unless it's a very large container and it has been grown, crop has been grown there repeatedly for a number of years. Thanks for clarifying that. So there's a follow-up question. Can you talk about leaching soil or controlled burns for getting rid of diseases or pests? I don't think I would do a controlled burn in my little backyard in Arlington. It might be illegal. No, um, um, anything that's not diseased can go into your compost pile. And uh, for those of you who have who are serious composters uh, and who are able to achieve the necessary heat to be able to kill off pathogens, well, you can actually use everything you've got. But if you have a disease or an insect infestation on a plant that you are removing from the garden, um, we suggest that you not compost that and you dispose of that plant in the trash instead. Okay, thanks, that's all. Uh, the picture here is of different kinds of nutrient deficiencies in plants. And um, the, I, I caution that you use these kinds of, if you Google nutrient deficiency in plants, you probably come up with many pictures of, of um, indoor hydroponic uh, marijuana that is grown you know, in, in, indoors. Um, but if you, you, you can actually look at these kinds of uh, pictures and then use this part of your research. If you can't see any sign of any disease on your plant or insect problems, um, you can begin to think that it might be a nutrient deficiency if you see you know, leaves turning yellow or brown. But again, because you're master gardeners and all wannabe, you're going to be testing your soil regularly. So you should know what the situation is with your soil. So Tim, we're going to talk next about uh, physiological problems and problems that are not diseases. And of course, the picture shows uh, pumpkins. Those are real live pumpkins, believe it or not, that have been grown in a mold, um, which, um, which, which shapes them into a face. And if you go, that website has all kinds of molds for watermelons and for cucumbers. And um, I, have, I had never seen this for, before I was looking for deformed fruit. So this is what I got when I Googled deformed fruit. Okay. So lack of pollination um, is often um, something that I get questions about. Um, uh, you know, is this a disease? What's wrong with my plant? And lack of pollination, the fruit will form, but it won't develop correctly. Um, sometimes they drop off. Sometimes they just rot on the stem. Um, 
this is a cucumber picture up here at the upper left. Uh, the incomplete pollination results in incomplete filling of the, uh, of the fruit. The seeds don't develop and the tissue around the seed, which is what we, what we eat, you know, also fails to develop. Um, here we have the same problem in uh, yellow squash, um, which is often considered to be also sometimes mistaken for blossom end rot. And you could have multiple problems on a plant at the same time. So um, this top picture shows a, a relatively normal development. These bottom five are all um, um, show signs of failure to pollinate correctly. Here we have a watermelon in the middle, which again, because it has not been pollinated adequately, has failed to develop. Can you still eat it? Sure, you can still eat it, but it's not going to be as full or, or as large as it would be otherwise. And it may be, uh, have other deformations inside the fruit, uh, which will be apparent when it's cut open. Um, here is corn on the upper right. And I have had this actually happen to me um, when I lived in California, it was late in the season, most of the insects had, had and the wind had done its, had, had failed, and I did not get um, good planting. It probably also did not have enough plants to do the good wind pollination that is needed for corn. But the failure to pollinate results in incomplete filling out of the, of the individual kernels in the ear of corn. And of course, at the bottom right, it shows the zucchini, which, um, Again, it's starting to turn yellow. It's starting to shrivel up. It is not a disease. It is just simply um, incomplete pollination. And one of the things you can do if you see this happening is to help it along. You know, use, use some pollen, move some pollen from one plant to another um, to help uh, from, from one plant to another, from one from the male flower to the female flower and um, help, that, help that move along. I once advised a gentleman to, to try this. He brought in um, zucchini, which looked like the cucumbers in the upper left-hand picture. And I said, go borrow your wife's makeup brush and uh, transfer some pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers. And I saw him a couple of years later and he said, Kirsten, it worked. He said, but my wife never talked to me again about that makeup brush. Okay. So blossom end rot, um, which we just mentioned with the picture of the squash, can occur to squash, but it can also occur, occur in tomatoes and peppers. Um, watermelon can experience this as well. You can have um, some lot of bad information going on about this particular problem. Um, it is caused by a calcium um, deficiency, but it's not often because the calcium is deficient in the soil. It's often because the calcium is unavailable to the plants. And environmental factors play a huge role in making sure that that calcium is available. Now you can go out and spread chopped up crushed eggshells all you want. But the reality is that it takes a long time for that calcium that's in those eggshells to break down and become available in the uh, elemental form that is needed for a plant to take it up. Blossom end rot can be caused by too much water. It can also result from too little water, but more often it's resulting from intermittent drought, um, watering and then drought again. And where the water watering is uneven, um, you will have a, a, um, a, limit, a limit of the, to the nutrients that are available to the roots to take up, okay? So sometimes um, it can also be exacerbated by having too much nitrogen in the soil. Um, you can also end up with, with um, too much um, uh, low pH, a lack of calcium, again, but that, again, that's very rare. And of course, the um, low night time temperatures can throw it off balance and make it more susceptible. Maintain constant and even soil moisture is going to be the ticket here and make sure that you mulch and cultivate only slowly and shallowly what during drought. The soil pH if possible should be between six and seven. And if you haven't checked it lately, that's a good thing to do. Here are tomato problems, which are not diseases. 
uh, that are typically environmental issues. We have sun scald on the upper left. Um, sun scald is, again, is an environmental disorder caused by too much exposure to sun. And we often see this where the tomato is developing um, close to a hot surface. Um, we see it where tomatoes have been pruned at the end of the season and the tomatoes are exposed to direct sunlight. Um, and sun scald will cause a, um, an irregular um, paper-like white spot on the fruit. Can you eat it? Sure, you can eat it if it's not started to rot throughout the stem, just simply cut off the undeveloped, the um, bad part of it. You want to uh, remember that when leaves, when, when, to, when tomatoes are pruned, um, you should do this earlier in the season before the, the fruits develop too heavily and you will get less sun scald on them. The bottom left shows, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom the top right shows green or yellow shoulders, quote unquote, on, on uh, tomatoes. Green shoulders where the fruit is red on the bottom, but the, doesn't develop, doesn't color up on the, um, on the top edges, um, results from um, um, too much sun exposure or when temperatures stay high for a very long time. And you all should remember that, that temp tomatoes, when temperatures, air temperatures are above 95, they don't, um, they don't produce fruit. They simply lie dormant until the temperatures go lower. Yellow shoulders, um, which is picture pictured here, is um, one of those conditions of very high temperatures. Lycopene is needed in the uh, ripening of tomatoes. And at very high temperatures, the plant does not uh, produce sufficient lycopene in some conditions. The bottom right shows cracking. Um, and cracking is the name that's given to a problem where the skin splits open. And it's caused by very rapid growth. Um, ideal growing conditions, really, um, with lots and lots of water. Cell division in these tomatoes um, is, is, growing, is faster than the skin can expand to be able to accommodate those, that new tissue. Uh, it particularly occurs after, in, in, a, in a situation where you have lots of water after a drought, okay? And of course, the bottom left picture shows um, something called cat facing. And cat facing is a name given to irregular development of the fruit that is um, um, caused by the development of fruit occurring during very um, cold temperatures. Okay, all right. Can you eat, you can eat all of these? Okay, just simply cut off the area which is undeveloped or affected by the crack or the cut facing, and um, call it a day. Okay, the picture on the upper left um, shows development of the seed inside the tomato. And in very old tomatoes, um, the acidity, which would otherwise um, cause, inhibit the growth of the seeds, causes, allows the seed to sprout while it's inside the plant. You've got plenty of moisture there, right? Um, the low acidity can occur when, when fruit gets old or in some fruits um, which are naturally advertised as being low acid. The um, seed sometimes grows so, develops so fast and so thoroughly that it can actually burst out the sides through the skin of the tomato. And this is a truly freaky looking occurrence, but um, it does happen from time to time and you cut into a tomato and you see um, these seeds sprouting. It doesn't make it unsafe to eat, um, but it's kind of an oddity you might want to share. On the picture on the right, we talked about this already. This is adventitious roots on tomato. Um, it is not a sign of any kind of disease or insect. Um, it allows you though to take a cutting and replant that and it will develop real roots once it's in the soil. Nutrient deficiencies on plants, um, again, can be prevented by the um, development of information. Okay, know what the soil conditions are um, and know what the nutrient levels are in your, in your garden. Do a soil test. First time, 
one time a year is a little excessive. You can probably get away once it's established that you have a healthy um, soil balance in an in-ground garden. You probably can get away with doing it every two to three years at the most. Keep in mind that when you do a soil test, it does for, from Virginia Tech anyway, it does not test for nitrogen levels. And the reason for that is that nitrogen is um, highly volatile in the soil. And if you measure it today, tomorrow, it's going to be different. It's coming out of the air, it's being used by plants, it's leaching out through water. And so, but you need to remember that your plants do need nitrogen. And the application of nitrogen is an annual need in any well-balanced vegetable garden. It's also good to know when you're looking, trying to diagnose a nutrient deficiency, whether the problem is occurring on new growth or on old growth. And if the old growth looks right and normal, um, but it's a new growth, which is showing problems, it could be a calcium problem and it could be an iron problem. And iron deficiency is going to show up at um, at higher pH levels, and it probably is a sign that you need to reduce your pH level. Okay, organic and or compost built soils can help make nutrients more available to plants, and not nutrients that are already in the soil. Um, the, the, the organic soils or the compost that you're adding to soils does carry some of its own nutrients, but beyond that, the compost helps to feed the microorganisms work in conjunction with the plant roots to be able to make nutrients available. Um, we have um, the, the role of soil water cannot be discounted. And if drought is, is an issue, if you have you know, pre, you know, regular periods of drought between watering, you can have soil nutrient deficiencies. I'd like to show this too. Um, this is what a typical result looks like from a soil test that is submitted. Um, make sure that you specify what crop you're wanting to be tested. If you don't do that on the soil test form, you will get a, an analysis, but it will not have the recommendations that you want for your, uh, for your plants. The, the analysis is going to um, show the results for the content of the soil for potassium, uh, which is K, phosphorus, which is P, calcium, magnesium, and so on, all the way down. A note that in this uh, particular section, uh, the major nutrients, the potassium and phosphorus, are listed as very high, and some of the other ones are too. And the rest of them say sufficient. If you add more nutrients, if you add more fertilizer to a soil with this level of rating, you will not make your plants grow faster. Okay, save your money. If you wait until your pH shows, um, you, I'm sorry, your, your nutrient analysis shows medium or medium plus, um, then you can begin to think about an annual fertilizer. But most importantly, you do need an annual fertilizer for nitrogen. But if your phosphorus and potassium are stable, you probably don't need to add more. The soil pH, which is the all important measurement that helps us determine whether those nutrients are available to your plants, and this sample is 7.8. And this is pretty high, too high for a successful vegetable garden in most cases. And so the next page that you're going to get to a soil test is going to have your recommendations. Obviously, you don't need to add lime because lime is going to make your pH higher. The um, soil pH needs to be lower, and I find the instructions do very well. Now, please note that there are multiple kinds of products that can raise the pH and understand what you add. Make sure you understand what you're adding to your soil before you do it and what the effect is going to be. Another um, um, comment I'm going to make about this particular recommendation is that I would not recommend aluminum sulfate as an addition to your soil. Aluminum is a toxic material that builds up in the soil. Um, the sulfur, however, the sulfate part of that is very effective at reducing the pH. So um, the option two, which is a more organic, um, slower, uh, perhaps kinder um, soil treatment is for a powder of sulfur called flowers of sulfur um, to mix into the soil and then retest it. You will need to retest the soil after four to six months of adding this kind of product to it to make sure that you're getting the results that you need. 
Okay. Um, there are, make sure that if you are doing a soil test, that you do a different test for different kinds of crops. If you have highly acid loving plants, that's a separate test from your standard tomatoes and other vegetable crops. So that the test form allows you to um, specify what, what kind of crop you're growing. Okay, then at the bottom half, it has a fertilizer recommendation. And notice that they are asking you on this particular test with a very high phosphorus and potassium level to apply a nitrogen only fertilizer. Pay attention to this, it's good information. If you need help uh, finding your test results, I can help you with that. If you need help interpreting them, uh, the help desk is also a good source for assistance with that. Um, make sure that you are uh, protecting your young plants when you, when you stick them in the ground um, to reduce the insects and minimize damage to the environment. You can also kind of kind of take a powder. You know, if you see, if you have that plant on the right side and, you, and you're saying, I'm, my plant is dying, my plant is dying, protect it from additional damage. But remember that the 30% rule, um, you do not need to treat um, this unless it, it seems to be continuing. Have an inspection, make sure that you're applying a control that is targeting the problem. Ways to minimize controls, um, optimize your growth, reduce plant stress, um, take, a, take a, a particular um, lesson from integrated pest management and avoid overhead watering if you can. Culture controls are what you can do in the garden to help limit disease problems. Mechanical controls, um, which you, you can use, which are going to be include tilling, sanitation, uh, using a tool to help um, prune away um, um, overcrowded plants will help. The solarization of the soil in very serious um, situations can help and that's, that that's means losing your soil for an entire growing season. Hot water controls on the seeds, again, another mechanical control. Biological controls, encourage beneficial organisms in your garden. Use live, healthy soil compost. Um, you can also um, use beneficial fungi and bacteria or nematodes to help um, reduce the bad guys in the garden. Um, specifically, are gonna be specific to a problem. And on the last resort, you can choose pesticides that will help um, to control whatever problem you're having. But make sure you check out some of the organic sources first. Cultural and preventative controls, make sure that you are maintaining the correct pH, um, ensure adequate fertility for your plants so that they don't have to struggle to find the nutrients that they need to maintain the physiological functions. Um, choose plants that are selected for, that are adapted to our climate and are selected for disease-free and resistance to problems. VFN, for example, is a designation for tomato varieties, which designates that they are verticillium, fusarium, and nematode resistant. And you can find resistant varieties. And know your crop. The picture on the right shows black panther peppers, and that black on there, that the, that's the normal look of that particular pepper. And so know what's normal for you for your particular crop. As it ripens, it turns orange and for, you know, develops further, but it starts out as an all black pepper. Pay attention to your planting time, pay attention to your plant thinning. Um, make sure that you are understanding that um, soil temperature is an important role, has, a, has an important role to play in plant disease. And if you plant some of these plants in cold soil, you will, you are inviting disease. So use a soil um, thermometer or temperature thermometer. Uh, make sure you're planting when the soil is at least 60 degrees or more. Um, and um, understand that some pathogens can be limited by removing the stress of the plant, putting it in a cooler place if it, if it's, or putting it in a warm place, drier place, um, if that's the problem. So overcrowding can cause weak growth or more you know, damage to growth that is more susceptible to, um, to plant disease. Watering, sanitation, weed control, and building up of healthy soils 
It's going to be very, uh, are very important tools that you can use to help limit plant disease. The picture on the right is not plant disease. This is freeze injury on peas. But again, the selection of varieties is very important to prevent this. The timing is very important. And those freeze damaged plants are going to be more susceptible to the onset of a fungal disease in the tissues. Crop rotation, the reasons to rotate include both pest control as well as nutrient management. The pests and the pathogens that um, attack our, our plants are usually very family specific. Um, for instance, you can follow a very heavy nitrogen feeder like grains with a legume family plant that will replenish the nutrients in the soil. The crop rotation offers you an opportunity to support your farmer's market and uh, but it can um, provide uh, and support the um, variety of beneficial insects that, that will help you in your garden. Group vegetables for rotation by family type. So your onions are one family, your garlic leaves, shallots and chives are a member of that family, your spinach chard and beets are a member of a different family, um, your cabbages, your cucurbit family, which include you know, radishes, collards and so on, broccoli, kale, those are going to be a third family. Then you have the peas, beans, and lead peanuts that are in the legume family. Uh, and then, of course, the squash family. Um, the um, cucumbers, melons, and pumpkins are also part of that um, part of the family, or another family. And of course, then the Solanaceae family, which is the tomatoes, pepper, and eggplant, rotate by families, not by individual plant. So you have to understand your crop. Okay, organic chemical controls. Before you choose any chemical control, whether it's organic or not, make sure that you read the label. Make sure that the label contains both the pest that you've identified and your host plant list. Okay, in other words, make sure that on the label it specifies anthracnose on strawberries if you're going to apply a product to prevent that fungal disease on strawberries. The Atra Biorational Database is a very cool site that you can put in both the product that you'd like to use, bicarbonated soda, soda bicarbonate, um, or the crop that you're trying to grow. And they will identify um, various um, organic products that can be used to cure specific diseases. Give them as much information as you can. Um, these products that are listed here are all products that are listed um, on the, this biorational database. And biorationals are products that are derived from or, um, or are actually are organic control products. Make sure that you understand that just because it's organic, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe for you or for a plant that you want to do. So understand your control, understand the disease, understand the needs of your crop are gonna be very important parts of what you, uh, of choosing a, a, a disease management tool. Okay, um, Virginia Tech has many uh, fact sheets on both diseases and insects, and they have a very interesting um, um, disease um, photo, disease lab with photos that you can access. The pest management guide um, is published new every year. We talked about this already, but it is the link is there and it is rated for homeowner use. In other words, there may be other products that can be used, but they, they are products that are limited to the use by commercial um, commercial pesticide applicators. They also have gotten much better um, with the organic uh, insect and disease controls that they recommend. And so it's a very valuable book to put on your shelf. You can reprint it every year. You can access it online, which is even better because then you can search uh, through the document um, using the fine tools. The National Pesticide Information Center has important information about uh, organic as well as non-organic um, pesticide use and products, as does the Organic Materials Review, Review Institute. 
So um, these are these are helpful uh, places that you can go to add to your knowledge about pest management. Um, finally, the uh, Virginia Tech plant diseases disease images are a place where you can compare what you've got to what um, what Virginia Tech has the disease clinic has already taken pictures of and identified. And the Master Gardener programs in Northern Virginia have developed a best management practices document, um, which goes into very generalized um, practices that you can do in, in every garden, in any garden, whether it's container or whether it's in the ground, to maintain um, plant health. Finally, there are some fact sheets there that are listed that are um, um, some, of the, some of the places that some of these sources um, uh, of some of the um, pictures and, and information that you received in this talk can be found for additional reading. And of course, there's a lot of information online. The Extension Horticulture Help Desk is located at the Fairlandton Community Center in Arlington, but every extension office in Virginia has a help desk like this. That you can send pictures to, you can call us, you can email, you can walk in. Uh, we'd love to see you. So um, the picture here is of damping off, which is a fungal disease that's soil borne uh, and affects new seedlings. All right, I know that there's many questions that you have about things that we have not covered, but um, these are gonna be the, the, typically the most uh, prevalent problems that we have here. And um, I hope that um, they don't affect you. <laughs> Kirsten, can we ask one last question? What are your thoughts on adding compost teas or other natural fertilizers periodically? Compost teas are an excellent way to um, deliver water and nutrients to your soil uh, quickly. Um, if you spread your compost on the surface, um, that will work as well. Um, the composts are not all created equal. And what you create at home, uh, if you choose to do that, if you have the space to do that, is going to be a lot more valuable than what you can buy um, at a garden center. Um, certainly the, the what's stored in plastic bags has been stored that way for a long time. And the nutrient, uh, and certainly there's no nutrient analysis attached to that in many cases. So um, you have no way of knowing what you're delivering anyway. So if you have the ability to, to, to um, access organic material, manures, uh, compost and manures or other kinds of what I call home compost sources, you can actually take that, put that into water in a bucket of water and use that to water your plants quite effectively. Great, thank you. And so that ends the questions. And we thank you, Kirsten, for all this great information. I learned a lot about my tomatoes. I didn't know. Years of cracked tomatoes, I had no idea what that was. So thank you for just a valuable presentation that'll be in the virtual classroom in, you know, within two weeks. And thanks to my colleague, Jason, for so aptly managing the chat room. And to everyone who attended today, we really appreciate your being here. And we hope you took out good advice that's gonna help you greatly improve your vegetables.